Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so we are getting back into The Boys by Garth Ennis. And this is kind of a, a funny situation, right? Because this is the miniseries Highland Laddie. And I was going through when I was reading this, because of course Huey is from Scotland, he was using Scottish phrases or Scottish slang, like to ken, T-O and then K-E-N. And like, I had to use context to figure out that means to know. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. Like, I guess ken means no. And I guess it's their, their, their slang words. If any of you guys here are from Scotland, like throw some slang words in the comments and let us know what it means. It kind of throws me off a little bit. So I'm trying to understand your language. <laughs> Try to understand your slang and uh, and hopefully I can if you guys if you guys help me out a little bit But if you guys remember in the last video that we did essentially Huey had walked away from Annie, right? Huey had learned that Annie had basically given to uh, Homelander, A-Train, and then to Black Noir in order to get herself onto the Seven. And Huey just simply wasn't able to process it. And lashing out, saying some pretty horrible things, he essentially instigated a breakup and then walked away. And so what this does is it basically picks up with him traveling back home again, right? Going back to Scotland and revisiting his family, kind of getting back to his bases. And this is a cool little thing here, right? Because he spends time with his mom, he spends time with his dad. Now keep in mind, these are not his actual biological parents, right? Huey doesn't know who his biological parents are. And for the most part, he doesn't really care, right? I mean, these are the parents that raised him. But the issue with this is that he gets a little frustrated with how his parents treat him and so far that his mom really kind of dotes on him and it kind of babies him to a degree now that'll become a little bit important later on down the line but what he does is he basically picks up with a character with a friend by the name of Deet and then with a friend by the name of Bobby now I say Deet because he says that Deet is short for detergent because apparently like he just never really used it he just you know smelled all the time but Bobby is a bit of a different story from what seems to have gone on in the time that Huey's been away which has been about seven or eight years Bobby has has basically started dressing up as a woman so it kind of takes it takes Huey by surprise surprise a little bit, <laughs> which is pretty interesting to see his reaction here. But if for him, it's kind of getting back to his roots, right? Now, this is something to notice here, how he relates with his friends, right? It's kind of like, hey, you know, it's good to see you guys again. And it's almost one of these things where he's kind of nostalgic for days gone by, right? He's nostalgic for a time in his life, which really seemed to be a lot simpler. Now, in reality, and that's, that's kind of the funny thing about nostalgia, the important thing to understand about nostalgia is just because you remember things being a certain way doesn't mean they were that way. It just means that's how you remember it. And when people always say, well, I wish I could go back to a time when I was younger and the world was a lot simpler. The world wasn't simpler when, 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 when you were younger. If you were just too young to understand how complicated it really was. And so that's really what's going on with Huey. For him, going back to a simpler time to a degree when he was a little kid, yes, things were things were simpler in so far as his, his responsibilities and his perceptions of the world. But the reality is the world was just as complicated as it ever was. He just didn't fully grasp it. He wasn't really exposed to it. And so spending time with Bobby and spending time with, with detergent, ultimately he kind of ends up going about doing his own thing and comes across a guy named Mr. Vigors who's basically painting a picture on a beach and it's kind of a cool thing because the two of them start talking and indeed like Huey starts talking about nostalgia and one of the things that he says is he you know coming back here he looks at his friends and it's kind of like he envies them to a degree right because they've continued on you know for them things haven't changed everything's the same way that it was before but for Huey everything's changed he's really starting to see the world for what it is not the way he envisioned it to be right not this, this kind of isolationist sheltered mindset that he spent so much time having when he lived out in Scotland and so as a result of that it's almost a little more, you know, a little too much for him to grasp. But Mr. Vigor says the exact same thing. He says, look, your perception of this isn't really because of the way things are. It's because you're looking at the world the way you see it now, and you're looking at the world the way that it used to be. And for the people here, they'll continue on their normal lives, right? They'll continue on doing their normal thing, and, and the world won't really change for them because they haven't seen the same kind of things you have. But for you, the world has changed, and it's not a bad thing. You just have to learn how to put it in perspective. And so because of the fact that Mr. Vigors offers this this kind, these, these little words of wisdom, you know, these little tidbits to him, what he basically does is really kind of form a bit of a friendship with this guy insofar as they kind of visit each other off and on and they start talking about these little individual things that they have going on in their own lives and really it's Huey kind of talking to, to Vickers and dumbing out a huge part of his life right you know one of the things he talks about is the frustration of his parents that he loves his parents but they baby him right they baby him in a lot of different ways he talks about his friends and even when he got a hard time from detergent and Bobby it was really more of them just giving him grief you know busting his balls because that's what friends do whereas being as part of the boys there were times when he was just downright humiliated but the reality is that Huey's kind of looking at it through the wrong perspective, right? He looks at it as though the boys are somehow have it out for him or they're trying to trying to screw him up. When in reality, they consider him to be a friend, right? Hence the reason why Mother's Milk opened up with his origin and the friend she and the female. Why they gave the origins their stories to Huey is because they view him in, in a lot of ways with some camaraderie, some brotherhood, that kind of a thing. And so again, you know, it's one of these things where Huey kind of has to keep things in perspective, sort of get things lined up and focus on the world the way that it needs to be, or at least the, the way it is in the right frame of mind. And so from here, you 
switch over to this small little thing, right? Which will become important once you get to the end of the story. But you switch over to this small little thing with a guy by the name of Tupper. Now, Tupper is basically a drug supplier, right? And he kind of has an international scheme going on. And what he does is he basically mingles cocaine with compound V and then sells it to people. And so it basically gives them a bit of a high and also some of the effects of compound V. Now, he's got a couple of guys who are basically in this part of Scotland who were kind of his suppliers, right? And, or not really his suppliers, his dealers in the sense that he gives it to them, they basically deal it out, then they come back with the money. And these guys start to get a little big for their britches, right? They start saying things like, well, if it wasn't for us, you wouldn't be able to get these drugs out there, right? You wouldn't be able to get people to buy them for you or anything like that. So I think we deserve a little bigger cut than what we're currently getting right now. And so as a result of that, what he does is Tupper calls in his niece, a woman by the name of Sarah, who's a pretty, she's a pretty hefty size, right? She's a pretty big woman who's also got an enormous pair of shears. <laughs> and puts him up to one of the henchmen and goes to start cutting off his face and these guys come to their senses pretty fast and like okay so like we'll keep on doing what we're doing we'll take a pay cut even you know we'll, we'll keep on doing what we're doing and yeah like we'll, we'll call that a day and that'll basically be it right they just kind of mind their own business from that point going forward and so what it does is it switches over to this little bit of an origin about huey and what he does is he starts talking about his aunt mary and what he says is that his aunt mary was a small woman she really seemed to show symptoms of like dementia or alzheimer's or something like that loss of appetite things along those lines but one night Huey basically wakes up to like sudden screaming and some blood that's basically around different you know uh, one of the rooms of the house and so for the most part like his mom and his and his, his dad are like you know stay quiet don't wake up Huey you're gonna scare the kid Huey already being awake basically goes into the bathroom where there's all this blood he looks into the toilet and he sees this 17 foot tapeworm and so basically Aunt Mary had basically you know been suffering from a tapeworm now things like dementia and Alzheimer's I don't believe are the byproduct of tapeworms it's usually things like loss of appetite diarrhea vomiting things along those lines but the reason why this is important is because it set the stage for Huey essentially being squeamish, not really being able to handle those things. And where he's talking to this guy Vigors about this story, you know, Huey's just kind of like, this is the reason why I've really always kind of had trouble with that kind of stuff. I've never really been a strong guy. That combined with the fact that he was always kind of babied by his parents meant that in reality, he was never really were and never really ready for the world. He was never really made to experience how tough life can really be sometimes. And so as a result of that, when he joined up on the boys, he basically ended up in this situation where it, it was a total 180, right? You had this sheltered kid from out in Scotland who always had his needs taken care of and never really had to worry about anything and had a couple girlfriends here and there and that was basically it to suddenly being in this world of violence madness and absolute chaos which he was totally oblivious to up to that point in time and so it's, it's a it was a huge shift and one that he wasn't really ready for and indeed in a situation like that you kind of have to be eased into it right you can't just be thrown into the deep end of the pool and expected to thrive there it just doesn't work that way and so of course he basically lashes out at his mom when he gets back home he lashes out at his mom at the fact that she's kind of babying him a little bit it really kind of drives him nuts he goes to spend some more time with detergent and Bobby sort of hanging out with them. And then once he gets back home, he ends up finding out that Annie's there, that Annie basically tracked him down to his home in uh, in Scotland and came to visit him. And from there, things get really, really cool because what you get here is this origin of Starlight, right? You get this origin of Annie. One of the things that had kind of gone on there in that huge fight between her and Huey is a lot of it was one-sided, right? It was Annie asking him, please stop, please stop saying these things. Let me explain. Let me tell you what was going on. Let me give you my side of the story. And Huey didn't want to hear it, right? He wanted to stay angry. He wanted to be upset and he wanted to leave, right? So he ultimately ultimately ended up bailing out. Annie coming here is for the purpose of saying, fine, you know, let's see if we can't find some common ground. And even if we can't, then let me tell you my story. Let me tell you where it all came from. And so of course, what she tells us is that she was born in, in Des Moines, Iowa, and she was born with superpowers, which of course we knew that all these little kids are basically injected with compound V during the gestation phase when it comes to them, you know, basically growing, you know, as a fetus in the mother's womb. And then when they give birth, you know, the kids come out with powers. Sometimes the powers manifest at birth, sometimes they don't. But Annie's powers manifest the day that she was born, she emitted this ultra bright light and blinded both of her parents in the process. And so following that, Vought American immediately became aware of what was going on with Annie and then basically told their parents, look, like we can make life easy for you. You know, you guys sign these NDAs. We'll make sure that you guys have all your needs taken care of. We'll provide you with seeing eye dogs. All you have to do is give up your child. And that's exactly what they did. They basically signed away Annie and Annie ended up going into a foster home or at least ended up being taken by Vought American and kind of experimented on for five years and then being sent to a foster home. But these foster homes didn't really exist for the purpose of like, like trying to give them a, a stable lifestyle, right? Trying to like take them in and give them a stable childhood so they could go on to become productive members of society. These foster homes were really more of like proving grounds insofar as they would go to these pageants for superheroes. And what would happen is they would dress her up in like a superhero costume. You know, it was very much like those uh, those child pageants, right? Those travesties when, when parents march their kids out there, put them on display for the world, you know, and kind of strip their childhood away. And so because of that, like when, when this whole thing went down, what you ended up getting was like this kind of performance, right? And Starlight played her part the way she was supposed to, right? She did 
did her song, she did her dance, she flew around, you know, she kind of lit up a little bit, but she couldn't do it super bright, otherwise she would blind everybody. But one of the other girls there started to lose control of her powers, right? Her powers weren't working the way that she was supposed to, and actually ended up melting her eyes out of her head, right? So not all of this went the way it was supposed to. And for those parents whose children proved to be superheroes, right? Proved to be people that Vought American could basically use to kind of go into superhero groups later on down the line and things like that, they were rewarded handsomely. For the parents of Starlight, they were basically given everything they needed from Vought American financially and otherwise to ensure that their daughter grew up and be, you know, use her powers and, and learn how to use her abilities and everything along those lines. Whereas for the family of this young girl whose eyes burned out of their head, Vought American was just like done, kind of swept the whole thing under the rug. And that was the end of that. The parents were just kind of left there, right? So in a lot of ways, when it came to these foster families, the kids were meal tickets and really nothing more than that. And so following that, as the years went by, Starlight eventually found herself on the Young Americans. But one of the funny things about this is that the Young Americans were not really given any direction, right? And we knew about this when it came to superheroes. We knew about that from the origin of the superheroes, right? In so far as they just went out there and did their thing. And that's really how Vaught American treated the Young Americans, right? They're like, okay, so here's your superhero team. You guys are going to be together. You guys are going to do your thing. Here's your Vaught American representative. If you ever need to talk to them, here's your, your liaison for the public eye, so on and so forth. Go be superheroes. And that was basically it. Now, the other part of this is that Huey actually asks a really good question. He says, if this was the case, and this is how you guys were being treated by Vaught American, then why not leave? Even if you couldn't light yourself up, you know, in, in a super bright light, that you could fly, you know, that you had some measure of super hearing, depending on your concentration, why not say, well, I can work for the hospital and I can fly people, right? I can, I can get a person from an accident site back to the hospital faster than a helicopter can. Why didn't you ever do that? And the initial statement of Starlight is, it just never really crossed our minds, right? Like we just wanted to be one of the superheroes, right? We were kind of caught up in the moment. And so the result is that when Vaught American had them carry out these various campaigns of superheroes, at the end of the day, they didn't really allow them to work with EMTs, right? They didn't really allow them to do things like ferry people from, from accident sites to hospitals. And the reason why was because what it basically did is it reduced the liability for Vaught American. Because superheroes were basically funded by Vaught American and Vaught was like the entity that kind of kept them in the public eye, they didn't want to disrupt the flow of money. If Starlight was, you know, picked somebody up and was going to fly them to the hospital and that person became too heavy and like she dropped them and they died, well, then it would be a PR nightmare for Vaught American, right? It'd be a public relations disaster. And so it would lead to problems. And so the idea was don't do anything that can disrupt the flow of money. And so because of that, Starlight and the Young Americans, their job was to just be in the right places at the right times and look like they were doing things or in some cases do things that seem to be worthwhile. But what it did is it kept them in the public eye and it kept them looking good. And so in turn, it kept the flow of money going. The other part of this is that you had things where she, you know, she was part of the whole believe system, right? The capes for Christ, kind of preaching this idea of Christianity and so on and so forth, all the while kind of feeling herself continually removed from it because she didn't really seem to, to believe in the ideas that she was espousing, but that's what she was supposed to do. That was the role she played. But understand, there's a huge difference between what's going on here and what's going on with the seven. In a lot of ways, she was naive, right? She didn't really understand what was really going on with the whole superhero community. She didn't know how far down this rabbit hole went. It wasn't until she joined the seven that she really began to realize that how dark and how screwed up things really are. And so at that point, Huey just kind of says, well, I mean, you know, that's, that's a sad story and everything and, and whatever, but like, it doesn't really change anything. And so the response of Starlight is, well, then tell me how you actually got this footage. And Huey's response is, well, somebody emailed it to me. And Starlight's like, yeah, I mean, you told me that, but it doesn't really make any sense, right? Somebody took some footage that happened to be of the girl that you were dating, which only you and I know that we were dating each other. Somebody took footage of that exact time period and then sent it to you. That means somebody had to know. But if you and I were the only ones who do know, then who else could have possibly known and how could they have found out? Now, of course, we know as the reader, Billy Butcher gave it to Huey because Billy Butcher knows that Huey and Starlight are dating because Huey told him as much, right? But Starlight doesn't know the other side of that coin. She doesn't know the story of Huey. Huey is still telling lies, right? He's still lying to her. And so at that point, you know, she's like, well, you know, because that's, that's, that's what girls like me do. We do whatever we have to do in order to get ourselves ahead, right? That's all we do. And it's just kind of like, damn, like, I mean, she absolutely lays into this guy, you know? And at that point, Huey, the, 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 the idea of him really kind of starts to fall apart, right? This stance, this, this hard line stance that he took of no, 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 you know, we're, we're, we're over, we're done, that kind of thing. It all starts to fall to pieces, right? It all starts to go away. And it's one of these things where he basically apologizes and says, I never really meant to say any of that. I never should have, I never should have said any of it. And Starlight says, I know those aren't things that you would really say. Somebody fed you that, right? Somebody told you, or somebody put those thoughts in your head. Those aren't thoughts that you came to of your own accord. Somebody showed you this, or somebody told you a thing. And in your desperation and in your, your sadness, you believed it. And now you're just parroting what somebody else told you. And so it's kind of cool because at that point, like that's the truth of the reality, right? The truth of the scenario is that Billy Butcher put the idea in Huey's head. No woman like that would ever date you because look how hot she is and look how reasonably attractive you are, right? Like what could you possibly have to offer her? She could have anybody. Why would she have you? Just so she can spend time quote unquote with 
with the commoners so she could say, well, I did that too. You know, I slummed it up with the regular guys too once, right? You know, that, that's that's why she did all that. Billy Butcher is the one that gave him that footage and said, here you go, you know, and, and, and put him in that vulnerable state in the first place and then capitalized on it to kind of turn Huey, right? But it wasn't really done from a place of being vindictive. It was done from Billy Butcher's perspective of you have to understand what superheroes are like, right? Billy Butcher does not believe in good superheroes. As far as he's aware, if a superhero goes the rest of their life without turning into a villain, it's because they just didn't live long enough. That's Billy Butcher's entire stance. And so following that, while Huey and Starlight are somewhat on better terms in the sense that she allowed herself to kind of get all that frustration and all that anger that she felt and to, to be allowed to tell her story, there's a kind of coldness there on behalf of Huey insofar that she crashes in the guest bedroom, but when she gets up in the morning, Huey's there. She's like, well, I need to change and everything. And Huey's like, okay, I'll leave you to it. He treats her more like a friend as opposed to somebody he's romantically connected with. And so because of that, when he gets, you know, back out of the house and, you know, he's talking to his dad and, and Annie's talking to his dad and that kind of thing. And, you know, his dad's like, well, hey, you should take Annie around town and, and show her what's going on. When that happens, Huey basically ends up taking her out and says, look, I've thought about everything that you said yesterday. And I've thought about the things that I said. And, and here's the deal. I get that everything that you did in terms of and whatnot, that was before you met me. Technically, it really isn't, and it isn't any of his business, and that's what he recognizes. But what he says is, I can't get past this. I cannot get past this idea that you basically gave guys a couple, you know, gave guys and them in order to get onto a superhero team. I can't get past that. I can't get that out of my head. And because I cannot get that out of my head, I can't be with you anymore, right? I just, I can't deal with this. I can't cope with this. And so because of that, when Annie asked the question, where does that leave us? He was like, there's nothing here anymore. Like we're not together anymore. We're done. Like we're, we're over with. There's no romantic connection between the two of us. And so while they, they still kind of seem to remain, uh, seem to maintain some measure of a friendship, what this does is it basically leads to them, you know, heading back towards, heading back to the house. And then of course, running into Mr. Vigors again. And this is kind of a cool little thing here, right? Because Vickers starts talking to Annie and, and the two of them kind of get a little bit cordial with each other, you know, and, and Vickers is like, well, I mean, you know, it's interesting, you know, of, of all the times that I've talked to Huey, he's never once brought you up, right? He's never mentioned you or anything like that. If I hadn't met you, I never would have known you existed in the first place, which really kind of speaks volumes, right? The fact that Huey would cut somebody like that out of his life in such a way that there really doesn't, does not seem to be any kind of attachment there anymore, right? There's no more romantic interest as far as he's concerned. She's a friend and somebody that he used to date once, and that's it, if she's even really considered to be a friend at all. And so in the midst of this whole conversation, conversation, what ends up happening is basically Vickers tells Huey, well, hey, I ran into your friend Bobby earlier today and, and basically like he tried to get a hold of you by phone. He wasn't able to do it, but he, you know, he gave me this message, told you to basically go meet him, you know, at, at around, uh, at around 10 o'clock. So they do, you know, once they end up meeting up there, of course, Bobby shows up there believing Huey summoned him there. So right off the bat, we kind of know it's some, some measure of a ruse that supposedly Huey had sent a text to Bobby saying, meet me here at this location at 10 o'clock. Now, when they get there, of course, what they end up witnessing is this guy Tupper and his various henchmen who were unloading drugs and planning to smuggle them throughout, you know, or get them throughout the, the area of, of Scotland. But then they find out that detergents basically join their group, right? Detergents join their team. And so where Bobby kind of screams out, oh my God, you know, it's detergent. That in turn brings the attention of uh, of Wee Sarah, this big old hoss of a woman who in turn kind of starts attacking the two of them. Now, of course, Bobby and, and Sarah get into a fight with each other. And then Bobby basically confronts uh, confronts detergent and says, dude, you have any idea what you're doing? This is cocaine laced with V. Do you have any clue the effect this is going to have on people? Now, again, this hits at the idea that in this small little island of Scotland, and they're cut off from the world. So unless you were actually out there in the way that Huey was, none of them really understand the effects of what it is that they're doing. Spreading this compound v lace cocaine all throughout this area of Scotland is gonna cause nothing but problems. At that point, Topper basically starts to freak out, pulls a gun and ends up pulling the trigger. But of course, detergent jumps in the way, shields Huey and detergent gets shot instead. And then seemingly somebody comes out of nowhere and basically takes out Sarah, cocks her over the head with a rock. And then we end up finding out, of course, that it's Mr. Vigors. So it's kind of like, okay, so Alistair Vigors, like there's more to this guy than initially seemed to be the case. Now, of course, this leads to Huey basically tracking this guy down, chasing down Tupper, who's sprayed in the mouth by a bird with all these little, you know, this vomit and all that kind of stuff. Basically, he gets vomit, like bird vomit and puke and all this nasty garbage and stuff in his in his mouth. And basically just wants to be shot by the cops, right? When the cops show up, he's like, just shoot me now. This is a horrible experience, <laughs> right? Which I kind of have to believe is true, right? You know, being, being, you know, having a bird projectile vomit in your mouth is probably one of the most horrific experiences that anybody could ever endure. But of course, not only that, you know, they go to visit Bobby in the hospital after it's all cleared up. Of course, you know, detergent had basically died, but they go to visit Bobby in the hospital and Bobby's really just kind of kind of like, hey, look, I mean, it could be worse. <laughs> you know, it could certainly be a worse experience. I mean, I'm kind of maimed a little bit, but I have my life, you know, and that's kind of the important thing there. It could be a lot worse than this. So he's kind of seeing the bright side of things, right? Not really seeing the worst side of things. And so from there, you get this really cool conversation that goes on between Huey and Annie. And of course, Huey basically tells this 
this story where he talks to her about the worst thing that he ever did, right? The worst thing that he's ever done throughout his entire life. Now keep in mind, it's probably a true story, but it's certainly not the worst thing Huey's done. But what he talks about is how himself and Bobby and Detergent had come across this dog that was stuck on a rock out in this, this, uh, out in this bog, this little body of water. And that initially they were kind of looking at it, wondering how it was that it got there. And then Bobby picked up a rock and threw it at the dog. And they started throwing rocks at it, seeing if they could hit it. Well, then suddenly like, you know, this dog starts to freak out. It ultimately falls off, starts to get carried away by the water. And, or at least, you know, starts to kind of drown in the water. Huey runs, grabs it, picks it up, and then basically take, you know, takes it back to the original owner. Now we don't really see who the owner is. We just see that Huey basically gives, you know, gives the dog to the owner and the owner gives him a bit of coin. And then like Annie starts to laugh at him. She's like, if that's the worst thing you've ever done, then you have to understand Huey, like this idea of being like this super hard ass, like being cold to the world, not really caring about anybody or anything and just kind of doing things your own way. Like that's not really a source of strength. If you believe it is and somebody lied to your ass, it's basically what she says. <laughs> She's like, that's not really the case. Like, like being kind to people, like letting people in, letting them understand you. Like how could you ever hope to have a truly intimate relationship if you never really let people see who you really are? At the end of the day, if you keep that part of yourself hidden away from everybody, well then you and your entire relationship is predicated on fear. You are afraid they're going to leave. So you basically never give them a reason to leave, at least as far as you're concerned. But the reality is not letting them see who you really are means you don't trust them. And if you don't trust them, then they're going to leave. So you're essentially setting yourself up for failure. And then all the while, you're gonna point the finger at the fact that they left as a reason why they can't be trusted when you were the cause of the problem in the first place. And so it's, it's, it's interesting because Huey kind of has to come to grips with this fact that what Annie is asking of him in terms of having a real tried and true relationship, what she needs from him is something more than he seems to have been able to give before. That yes, she gave guys and a couple of guys in order to get herself on a superhero team. But that was before Huey met her, right? So unless Huey's looking to date a woman who's never been intimate with another guy before, good luck, right? He's gonna have to go find some girl who's had a life as sheltered as he has and who's like a virgin in order to find that. There's a little bit of reality that has to come into play there, you know? And so ultimately Huey has to kind of come to grips with this. And so as a result, when he gets back home, what he ends up doing is talking to his parents and they say, of course, you know, well, this guy, that guy, Alistair Biggers stopped by for you. Uh, you know, he said he wasn't able to get a hold of you, but he went ahead and left this message for you. And basically it's a piece of paper with the with a phone number and the name Mallory. Now, for those of you guys who who, have, who, have, who haven't really been following this, Mallory was one of the original members of the boys, the one who effectively quit. Basically meaning that Alistair Vigors is not his real name. It is actually Mallory, the guy who originally put together the boys team. And whether or not he was spying on Huey is yet to be seen. But all we know is that Huey's basically been, been confiding in this guy the entire time. So it's kind of curious to see how all that unfolds. And so what you end up getting in this kind of little tidbit here is Huey going about doing his thing, basically, you know, heading out of Scotland alongside Annie and then boarding this bus. But one of the things he doesn't tell his parents is, I love you. He doesn't say that to them. Instead, he still kind of views the idea and he's still kind of angry at his parents because they baby him so much. But the reality is that other people out there have had these exceedingly hard lives. And if the biggest thing that Huey hates about his parents is the fact that they dote on him too much, that's not a bad thing to be upset about, right? There are people out there who would love to have that kind of relationship with their parents, but they don't, right? So it's nothing to be angry about. And Huey really kind of comes to grips with that when he starts breaking down and crying and saying that like, he should have like, told him he loved him, should have told him that he cared about him. He's never really told them that before. Right, it's something that they've never really heard from him, and so because of that, is he hasn't really appreciated them in the way that he was supposed to, and that of course will become a pretty significant plot point later on down in the story. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and I will catch you all later. Peace.